Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Cash Talk and today I'm joined by one of my friends Gianni Musumeci and today we're going to be speaking about all things property um, as a uh, property uh, consultant, a um, person that works in the game, um, you know, he, he knows a lot about what's going on in the property market and we'll be coming in from all different angles, obviously as a financial advisor, as an asset in being in property, um, it's it's something that we work with all the, to- all the time and in Australia there's a big fascination around property but Property in Australia is going through a kind of unique time period um, because for a long, long time we haven't seen the property property prices uh, retract in in major CBD, uh, CBD areas and capital cities for a while. Um, so it'll be interesting to unpack that. So Gianni, thanks for jumping on. No, thank you, mate. Pleasure to be on board. Uh, awesome, mate. Awesome. Now, Gianni, um, a lot's going on in the property market, and obviously, um, you work really uh, close with clients in regards to the uh, for them understanding what's going on in the property market and and preparing them for you know potentially that next property purchase or the property purchase that's happening. But what are you feeling on the ground? What's what's happening with with consumers at the moment? Look, I think a lot of people have concern over. Um, You know, there's a couple of concerns. Uh, So the first concern might be like the fear of overpaying. So people that are looking to enter into the market, they're fearful that if I buy now, will it go down further and therefore I've overpaid? And the other fear may be a fear of getting out. So because people may have purchased during the peak or or in the upswing, they might might be sort of considering now, oh, did I buy at the right time? Do I need Mm -hmm. to get out now? Things are starting to get a little bit tight. Um, yeah, should I should I now get out? And then, am I able to achieve the same price, if not make a profit, or if, even make a small loss at, in some cases? Mm. And what's what's your what's your thoughts on those fears? Because obviously, I'm, I'm finding that timing the market starting to step in, um, both on the stock market and both on the property market, that people are, are trying to kind of time this thing. And and as we both know, it's it's not perfect. But you know, what's your kind of what's your take on this? Yeah, so look, timing the market is always very difficult. There's a bit of a saying in property, it's not uh, it's not timing the market, it's time in the market. So look, a lot of people are feeling uh, or thinking short term at this stage. So they may have bought in the last couple of years during COVID and the upswing and that sort of thing. And they're sort of thinking, oh, you know, should I cash out? Should I um, take my money and run? But it really, it's it's time in the market. So we we sort of in the property circles, we know that, uh, property has its cycles. It might have a little bit longer cycle compared to, you know, uh, managed funds or shares. Mm. Typically, people sort of think that property has an eight to twelve year cycle, and this is just part of a new cycle that's occurring. So, mm. generally, the the downswing of any property cycle is roughly twelve to twenty four months, depending on the sort of market that you're in and the conditions and that sort of stuff. So, uh, I, I think that people that are fearing oh, you know, is not now the right time to get out or am I actually overpaying? They're, they're sort of thinking very short term. Um, and if they were looking to make a quick flip in property, that, that probably wasn't the right strategy. So I think that they should, if anything, look to hold on to that asset a little bit longer. It is a long-term asset. Um, and it's you should really look at the future growth. Um, and I sort of ask people to look at some of the indicators for future growth as well. You know, considering Australia is still a very... Uh, growth orientated population. There's a lot of uh, forecasted population growth coming into Australia, particularly with the um, uh, opening up of the visa uh, migration. So I think uh, they've extended the, the visa cap for next year to 200,000 skilled migrants. Um, and, and that's on top of the sort of regular migration that we have. So you know, th- there's still a lot of growth to occur in, in Australia and the, and the demand for housing is only going to grow as well. Um, and it's a, it's a lever. It's a lever that the government obviously can pull as well too. So I think that the this, this, the big one is that we've seen them react. Like obviously the government knows that there's certain indicators that they're watching in regards to property. And it's not to say that they they just want property to continue to grow. That's not the case. They you know property is a basic need. It's shelter. Yeah. Now yes, you can rent. Yes, you can own. Um, from a wealth creation perspective, you know there's an argument that you should own the asset okay um for 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 that period of time but you know what gianni saying as well too is very important around the long-term focus in regards to property and when we're when we're building plans and we're executing on a a property acquisition um strategy we're not doing this for two seconds and i think this is the this is the chase of the quick buck that we're seeing at the moment and now we're seeing that that the greed is turning into fear 
But remember, as Warren Buffett says, to be greedy when people are fearful and to be fearful when people are greedy. So my other point, Gianni, are we now starting to see some opportunities arise? Yeah, look, definitely there is some opportunity. And, uh, you know, for those sort of seasoned investors or people that are looking at entering into the market that have they have that avo- uh, affordability, they have that borrowing capacity, there might be potentially uh, an option to purchase something that is um, undervalued at the moment. Mm-hmm. So you, you could potentially purchase something for under its value and make a little bit of money. That's one of the ways sort of investors can make money straight away when they're looking to purchase a property is, is purchase it for under its estimated value. Because uh, it, it's interesting how the confidence and the psyche of the investor plays such a plus such a part. On the way up, it's the you know euphoric, most you know built on optimism, which overshoots the proper price of that that asset. And then on the way down, it's that extended fear that you know the, it's it's the world is coming to an end, and that you know property is not going to return to where it's going to return to. And as we know. It's not usually like that in regards to reality. You know, the property market has gone through, and we're talking about the property market now, has gone through some amazing feats. You know, global financial crisis, um, world wars, like there's yeah. just so much out there. And what Gianni was talking about before around, you know, population, locally in Australia, we have a lot of land mass, yeah? And yeah. we've got you know, a baby boomer scenario where people are going into retirement, okay? And the government knows that they need more taxpayers to help fund their future growth of of the country. And with that future growth and that future population, they need, like, they need to be housing these people. So we're going to, like, I can't see the um, visa changes all of a sudden going back to what they were. I think this is more of a permanent move than an actual, because they want the, they want the country to grow. And especially, like I said, on the back of the data and the demographics in regards to like the baby boomers and stuff like that, um, the population in Australia um, needs to grow. And, there's, and there's, there's clear indications from the governments and the people at B to continue to make that happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we talked about a lot of the levers that the government can pull, like uh, baby boomers. There's one of the levers around the baby boomers where they're enticing baby boomers to downsize and providing them potentially Centrelink breaks or tax breaks as a result. So that actually increases the um, the availability of housing because baby boomers are downsizing and therefore there's more family homes available. Um, and another one of the, the levers are, uh, around, uh, we've heard about co-ownership schemes for property, mm-hmm. Um, so there's all sorts of uh, legal and tax incentives that mm-hmm. uh, the government can pull as well in terms mm-hmm. of uh, making housing more affordable or even making housing more available as well. Building approvals is another one. I know in the capital cities, Sydney, especially here in Sydney, I think the a- average uh, building approval is roughly 18 months, particularly in mm-hmm. the CBD, which it just plays chaos for a lot of construction companies as well because you're waiting on those approval and you're sitting idle while you're waiting mm-hmm. for those approvals come, to come through. Well, it's interesting because I have a lot of people probably like you, Gianni, where they're like, oh, I don't want to purchase now. I want to purchase in another three months to like when interest rates are kind of kind of cap out and they're they're getting focused in regards to this crystal ball. But people also need to understand that if you're thinking like that, how many other people are thinking like that? And and we talked about and you did a great video the other day in regards to like supply and demand and, and how that plays its part. And and it's not as easy as just looking at that. Like that's that's one is I, I would be saying to that person, well, one, you know, does your affordability stack up? Does it work in regards to your financial plan? Does it take into regards to your risk tolerance in regards to how much you can tolerate? Property is a growth asset, even though people that, you know, are probably in their 30s, if not 40s, have never experienced the kind of property downturn just because of freak, you know, property boom in Australia there is property downturn. So it is sitting in a growth asset. So, you know, I think that those levers, which I'd love to discuss, like we've talked about some in regards to, you know, um, the the visa, but there's also, you know, a a lot of supply issues happening as well, because obviously the demand side is from the, the housing and the actual need to obviously have shelter and stuff like that. But there's also supply as well too, isn't there? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thank you for the mention of the video. The other day, I, I talked about a lot of the construction supply issues. So building approvals is, is one in terms of, um, you know, the, the 
supply indicators for property. Uh, but the other one, uh, sorry, was um, the availability of, of funds as well. So mm-hmm. borrowing capacity at the moment is, is at a low uh, mm-hmm. and that's because of interest rates. So who's to say when funds become more available for you, so potentially interest rates could come down in the future. Um, Mm -hmm. When they do come down, everybody's borrowing capacities will go up because obviously they have more money to spend. Mm -hmm. But therefore you've just increased the demand for uh, property because Mm -hmm. typically human behavior is if I have money, I'm gonna spend it. Therefore property prices will go up due to the availability of money. Mm -hmm. So even though your capacity might be a little bit lower. You sort of think, oh, I'll look to buy when interest rates are down. Um, the demand is also going to go up. And if there's more available money, then there's going to be more demand for property driving up prices again. Yeah, um, and, and, that, and that supply and demand pendulum just can move quite rapidly. And that's yeah. why when that's why we're like refocusing on like the long term, yeah? Because from a short term perspective, this thing can move quite quickly. and the property market is also very sensitive at the moment. Yeah, sensitive mm-hmm. to data, sensitive to information. It's it's really, really sensitive. And, you know, I, I just want people that if you're looking to buy and all of the numbers stack up, yeah, so if all the numbers stack up, it's a part of your strategy. It's predetermined in the good times, not in the bad times. Yeah. Why aren't you executing? Yeah. Yeah. Is it your emotions that are getting in the better of you? Okay. And it's, but it's the same as the flip side on the upturn. Yeah. If like on the upturn, <clears throat> do you need to buy that next investment property? Like what's making that happen? Like it wasn't in the strategy when you had a clear mind and logic. Like why is it now in the strategy? Yeah. And so when you think long term and think logically, wealth creation is really backed off two major asset classes. Yeah. Property and stocks. Okay. And really, you've got to accumulate enough of those to generate a certain type of income and certain type of accessible assets for you to become financially free. And if people want to boil down, that's that's ultimately why you're investing. Like that's why you're doing things for. You're not doing things usually to just have more zeros in your asset pool. Yeah. It's for a reason for you to live a certain lifestyle. And so when you're looking at it, property, for example, you know, I was doing, I, I shared some Sydney stats and obviously this is similar in Melbourne and in most capital cities around Australia. We're seeing things at 10%, 15%, 20% discounts than where they were. So just pause for a second. It's 10 to 20% cheaper than it was at, at the peak. So this should have been t- enticing you more to buy, not to not to sell, not to not act. Okay. So this is one, but I'm not telling for people to, to just go out and buy. Remember predetermined strategy based on, but it should be enticing you. And this is the same kind of emotional uh, behaviors that you experience in the stock market. Some stock markets are down 25%, some down to 15%. And I'm having more conversations around people based on fear than I do based on greed. Yeah. But the, for a professional investor or a successful investor, we're really excited about the opportunities that these assets are, are actually cheaper than they once were. And what will happen is, is as these potentially continue to fall, or even if they stayed the way they were, we're more enticed as successful, like as, as professional investors, people in the know-how to become more attracted to those assets. So yeah. if you find yourself if you find yourself thinking the opposite way. Have a reality, like a bit of a reality check. Just stop, pause, and say, well, isn't something cheaper than it once were? Yeah, if my cash flow stacks up, if my strategy stacks up, you know, so much. Emotions has such a play, doesn't it, Gianni? Yeah, look, particularly with owner occupiers as well, that they sort of they get very sentimental about home ownership and they sort of think, oh, you know, I can see my family grow up here. We're going to have barbecues, have our friends over, all that sort of stuff. So they they don't really look at it from a cash flow perspective. They, they look at it from a very emotional perspective. Uh, you and I, as investors, you know, sort of being in the trade, if mm-hmm. I use the analogy, if your favorite store had 20, 30 percent off, you'd lick your lips like you'd open up your wallet and go, yes, let's go shopping. That's actually what's happening today. Like you, uh, everything's on sale. So mm-hmm. go out and, and buy within reason, and mm-hmm. of course, mm-hmm. go do your analysis and you know mm-hmm. careful uh, due diligence. But that's mm-hmm. what's happening at the moment. So if anything, there should be you know more 
uh, more careful analysis at getting into the market now rather than mm-hmm. getting out of the market or, or yeah. considering if you're overpaying. And, and the other thing is, Gianni, is like if you use that moving forward, you can also think, like, don't get me wrong, there's some sales where the next week it goes on sale for 30% and you're like kicking yourself, yeah? But it's still yeah. better than if you paid full, full price. Like, That's but it's right. just, yeah. it's just, it's hard to figure out what that price is going to be. Now, mm-hmm. we've already seen in regards to property, we've already seen the RBA not go at the half a percent, they're already going at the quarter percent, okay? We're now starting to see the levers in regards to the immigration continuing to happen, yeah? So most, I was, sp- I was listening to a well a regarded economist and I've been listening to a few of them and they're saying that the property downturn is going to be anywhere between not is going to be anywhere between, okay, around 15 to 30% drawdown, okay? Yeah. And we're already starting to see people into, into like, at that levels. And mm-hmm. so, it, like I said, if it's in regards to your your, your plan and you've, ex- like, you've got that in your strategy, it, property is coming more attractive than where it was, you know, um, at the start of the year. And yet people were, you know, all prepared to go full guns blazing back then. The other thing I wanted to speak about, Gianni, is obviously the people that are in a position where they may be needing to downsize or they ne- may be needing to sell. Now, obviously, it's n- on the flip side, for the seller, it's probably not the most ideal time, okay? Which means something for both the seller and the buyer here from this conversation that we're going to be getting into because you don't really want to be a seller in a downward market, are you? No, well, what, what I normally tell people is when the market is coming down or when the market's on its way down, you want to actually be upsizing. So, so let's say, for example, you, you have a million dollar property and you want to move to a $2 million property. The market more uh, market moves in a uniformly 10%. So your property will go down to 900 and the $2 million property will go down to 1.8. So you've actually saved yourself $100,000 there because there's a 900K difference rather than the $1 million difference. So if anything, if you were looking to upsize, now would be the time to consider it because if the market has more moved uniformly in, in that 10% direction, then you're actually saving yourself money. Um, mm-hmm. So now might be a good opportunity to upsize and save yourself you know, cash, uh, upfront costs and uh, loan repayments. Yeah, correct. So see, there's, 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 there's views that need to be taken that you may not be looking at because most people are just like, I won't sell. Well, what, well yeah. no, but what's your next goal? Like, what are, you, what are you trying to achieve from this? And it's around getting deeper into that conversation to the reason why, the objectivity around the solution that really mm-hmm. kind of gets to the gets gets to it. Now, I want to go a little bit different uh, in, in, regards to, in, in regards to obviously buy, uh, buyers and sellers because I think we've given a lot of information about that. But the other one I get a lot, Gianni, is two things is around, one, I don't have time to go find the property. So my strategy might say that, for example, I need to buy a property, I need to obviously do it, whatever it is, but I've got kids, I work a lot, I just don't have the time to do it. And um, so that's one around the time factor. And um, the second one is around, what do I look at when I go to buy a house? Because I'll go on to maybe these online searches, like how do I figure out the right house that I wanna purchase for, for investment purposes? Yeah, so look, for those sort of time poor individuals, what, what they could do is they could consider the, the services of a, a buyer's agent. So typically what they say is on average, it takes roughly 40 hours to find and, and locate a home. Um, so if you don't have 40 hours over the, sp- over the span of sort of six, seven weeks, you could probably consider using a buyer's agent as well to sort of help you out there. The, the sort of advantages that a buyer's agent will, will give you is number one, they'll, they'll take the time off you, but number two, they've got the experience behind them. So a buyer's agent actually purchases property day in, day out for a living, whereas typically the average Australian may have only purchased one or two or maybe three in their lifetime sort of thing. So they won't have the exposure or the experience to the property market and, and purchasing homes. Uh, mm-hmm. The other thing that a buyer's agent can, can sort of give you as well is they can give you a lot of insight into the market and they have those relationships and contacts. So, you know, more often than not, if your buyer's agent specializes in a certain area, they have a certain niche in their market, then they can actually get the inside scoop on mm-hmm. um, what is coming onto the market, what mm-hmm. is off market and what has mm-hmm. sort of uh, come off the market we call post market. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. pre-market might be a property that is um, going through the process of having its marketing uh, mm-hmm. organized, so photos, listing, mm-hmm. all that sort of stuff. Um, off market is where 
uh, the vendor for whatever reason doesn't want to list. You know, sometimes people, uh, they want a private mm -hmm. sale. They want to privately mm -hmm. sell their home. Mm -hmm. And that might be because um, they want to don't want to tell the neighbors or the family. They might be going through a messy divorce. Um, there might be a number of other reasons. And then post market is where something just hasn't sold while it was on the market and sort of reached the term of the agency agreement. So like mm -hmm. it's no longer in the hands of the real estate agent that's come off the market. Mm -hmm. So they're the sort of advantages that a, that a buyer's agent can provide. And they can also mm -hmm. remove a lot of the emotion from the process as well. So mm -hmm. we talked about um, FOMO. Uh, mm -hmm. fear of getting out and then fear of overpaying as well as which is the, the last two we've sort of seen at the moment um so that's that's sort of the things that the buyer's agent can help you out with there to alleviate especially a lot of those things that hold back making a good decision in regards to what needs to happen and and the second one as well too is gianni is is what do i look for in a good home from an investment perspective like it's around like a, there's a lot of people who have ever bought their own investment property it's failed or it hasn't worked out there might be also you know people that have never invested before so it's something that i hear all the time it's obviously um i know personally but as a not a licensed buyer's agent i can't tell you what they are but gianni you know let us know the inside scoop in regards yeah. to what do we need to look for yeah, for sure. Look, typically, when I'm when I'm looking for an investment property, you look for a number of the growth drivers. Now, some people might look at past performance, but as we know, past performance isn't indica isn't an indicator of future performance. So, what is going to gr drive growth in the area? So, we want to look for infrastructure spending from um, local government councils or even state government councils that sort of says that, hey, we're enticing people to work in this area, and those jobs are going to remain as well. Mm -hmm. So, it's not good that okay, we're going to build a highway nearby and it's going to have a thousand temporary jobs because it's going to be a bit of a flash in the pan. Uh, also, we look at like, um, we don't want to sort of see mining hotspots either because they, they could be considered temporary jobs as well. So like big infrastructure builds that are going to keep jobs in the area and bring people into the area. So we hospitals, talked about population. Like hospitals, schools, like railway stations, a lot of that sort of government infrastructure as well. Even um, private infrastructure builds like shopping centers, yeah. um, that sort of stuff. Yeah, we want to see those sort of things. Uh, the other thing that we want to look for as well is uh, we want to see that um, building approvals are in the area as well, but they're at a steady rate. So we don't want to see um, the supply of property go too high because then what that actually creates is an oversupply and where uh, supply is higher than demand, then the actual price will drop. So we've seen a lot of that happen in, especially, you know, I'm going to use Sydney again as, a, as an example, a lot of inner city units come up. So if you purchase an inner city unit anywhere in the last sort of five or 10 years, they're a dime a dozen at the moment and they haven't really had strong growth because of that oversupply factor and they're just sort of being churned out. So oversupply is a big sort of consideration there as well. So there's some of the, look for some of the growth drivers uh, around mm -hmm. okay, what are gonna actually bring people to the area as well. Mm -hmm. um, last thing I, I sort of look at before considering the, the house or the property itself mm -hmm. is around the cash flow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's no good having a sort of high rental yield area um, mm -hmm. if your expenses are gonna be just as high because then the property isn't gonna take care of itself. Mm -hmm. For me personally, I'm not a big fan of uh, negative gearing because a lot of people just think, oh, I'll negative gear mm -hmm. and, and I'll get the tax breaks. Mm -hmm. You can negative gear for a short term, but what you want to see is rental growth. So, okay, you might negative gear for the first few years, but then the property will actually be positively geared or positive cash flow. And that's mm -hmm. to the point where the property is actually taking care of itself. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if in terms of a newborn baby, you sort of look after it for the first couple of years and then it starts to sort of walk, feed itself, take itself to the bathroom. That's the sort of a, a analogy that I like to use for, for property as well. In some cases, you might be negative gearing at first, but mm -hmm. then there's a sort of rental growth driver. So again, you want to bring people to the area. You want to have a good balance of uh, rental properties to owner occupied as well. So that's the other thing is typically in an area you want slightly more owner occupied than you will uh, rental properties and that's because um, typically owner occupied people they they keep up their homes a little bit nicer uh, I think investment property owners don't tend to improve they'll they'll maintain their homes but they won't improve them to a point that you know they'll, they'll want to show off to the join Joneses sort of thing so there's mm -hmm. some of the indicators that you'll want to see for a good area you want to see the the drivers for supply and demand um, mm -hmm. and, and you want to see like a, a good solid steady growth rate as well 
there, there's some really really great insights. So I was gonna I was gonna ask you um, two things. Well, one I, I was actually gonna say was I had the similar view in regards to negative gearing. I think that there's this obsession with negative gearing, but remember everyone that negative gearing means you're losing money. Now, with the objective being that you're buying assets to be in a position to have a passive income to exceed your lifestyle expectations, you can't be having negative assets. You know, you need to be having positive assets to be able to do it. So, and I think the other thing is remember, it's negative gearing is more of a tax break. Yeah. So let's say your tax, let's say your, your tax rate is 30 cents in the dollar, they make it easy. You're still losing 70 cents. So yeah. we don't want to be losing money, we want to be making money. Now, the other one you said the other one that I wanted to mention was an old one. And I want and this maybe this has changed with the new landscape we find ourselves in in post the COVID world. And that's around draw, you know, radiuses around the C B D. So, you know, five Ks, ten Ks, fifteen Ks, and you want to try and get as close as you can, and that's where the premium suburbs are. But are we starting to see that change, Gianni? You know, like the world is changing. Yeah, look, what I've noticed over the last couple of years, especially around COVID, is um, I, I've sort of seen a boom around what I call the regional hubs. So mm -hmm. there's a lot more employment that is being driven towards these regional hubs. I know in sort of regional New South Wales and mm -hmm. and even other locations that people are starting to go to these regional hubs because, because of work from home, essentially. And then a lot of offices uh, are starting to look at these other um locations as you know means of having a hub as well so no longer i think that will come to the conclusion that if you want to work you'll need to be close to a cbd location so uh what i'm starting to notice as well is a lot of these regional hubs are popping up as well mm. um number one is because of uh, work from home abilities but number two there's a little bit of infrastructure spending around some of these locations as well um mm. affordability is also driving a lot of these um people that are intrastate or intra sorry intrastate or interstate migration so recently because of covid we've sort of seen a lot of migration from victoria and new south wales to queensland and mm -hmm. that is because of a couple of things we, we sort of mm -hmm. saw affordability uh was more reasonable in queensland and, and maybe the climate as well um but a lot don't of people tell, don't, 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 don't tell all the queenslanders that the yeah. state is is better than sydney and melbourne we, we won't hear the we won't hear the end of it but anyway yeah no i'll, I'll never leave sydney but yeah, look at for, <laughs> for those reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> I think it. that they're moving to to Queensland. Um, mm -hmm. and the other thing is is affordability as well. What I've sort mm -hmm. of noticed as well is is there's still a boom in a summit of these locations, particularly uh, we saw Queensland, Sunshine, uh, Brisbane, Sunshine Coast, but another one was also Adelaide as well. Mm. So Adelaide, the affordability is actually pretty pretty decent. Um, yeah. I think I, I posted the statistic the other day that the price to income ratio for property in Adelaide is roughly 3.3, 3.4 to 1. Uh, mm -hmm. As I, I think it was June 30 this year, which means mm -hmm. that for every dollar average income a person owns, um that the the price of a property is roughly 3.3 3.4 times that in adelaide when you compare that to melbourne and sydney i think melbourne is about nine and a half and sydney is about 11 to one again as wow. a line so if you in terms of affordability that really drives a lot of uh migration to those locations as well now gianni i've got no stats around this so you might need to just intervene if i'm totally off it as well too i also find that when you come to things like interest rates and stuff like that as the price goes up, the the properties that are more expensive are more price sensitive, but then it probably caps out at a particular a particular level when you know they've got heaps of wealth and can kind of throw it around. But what I'm trying to get at is are you finding like, I don't know, let's say sub one million working a little bit different to maybe plus one million? Because when we're doing like serviceability for, for lending and stuff like that, obviously lending's come down. Therefore, the person that was maybe earning uh, could afford a $1.2 million house is now earning $1 million. And there would have to be kind of some chain reaction because you move down the stream, it's harder to move up the stream. So are you finding that that happening? Yeah, look, um, there, there's a website that I go to. It's a, a core logic website where they have an actual heat map to show mm -hmm. um, where the growth and decline has been over two periods, three months and 12 months. So they look back at the previous three and the mm -hmm. previous 12. And what I normally see is that there's a bigger swing in your blue chip suburbs. So mm -hmm. in Sydney, it's your it's your northern suburbs, your northern mm -hmm. beaches and your eastern suburbs, sort of like mm -hmm. Bondi, Coogee, Randwick, mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, that's where the actual biggest swings are. And that's where you sort of see like your 10, your 15% decline over the, sort of the last couple of periods. Um, whereas, 
in comparison, your blue collar suburbs uh, mm -hmm. are actually still growing. Like there's some locations that are still, you know, ticking over mm -hmm. one or two percent over the last few months, or mm -hmm. even 10, 15 percent growth in the last uh, 12 months. So if anything, there, there's been bigger swings in your blue collars, uh, sorry, your blue chip suburbs, like your your coastal locations, and mm -hmm. less less sort of swing, even a steady sort of growth in your blue collar suburbs. Um, and that sort of irks me when people throw around sort of general statistics like, oh, there's a decline of 15% in Sydney. I'm sort of thinking, well, not everywhere. Like you, you really yeah. got to pick your pockets sort of thing and, and see what you're thinking. Like, again, we talked about emotion. When they throw up those sort of clickbait headlines in the news items, that can sort of um, strike a lot of fear in people. But it's it's not the case sort of citywide, nationwide sort of thing. Yeah, 100%. And it, it's something that... I find it's going back to emotions, yeah, as well too. So you got to think about it. What he's talking about is those. Just think about when the when the when money's cheap, yeah, and it's economic prosperity. Everyone wants to kind of be on the beach of Bondi, for example, or close close as they can to it, yeah. So they're gonna people are going to overstretch themselves when they're getting into those markets. Now they'll try and hang on as long as they can, but reality is the numbers are the numbers and if your you know repayments gone from five thousand dollars a month to seven and a half grand a month and you can't put food on the table well maybe you might need to you move a couple of suburbs out and this is what we're getting at those other suburbs out are potentially still holding growth because people are moving out into those suburbs as well holding up those prices and yep. let's let's honestly talk you know straight it's easier to afford a house worth six hundred thousand than it is to afford a house worth $6 million, okay? So this is what I'm getting at, and I don't have the stats and the data, but from my observations, yeah, that I'm seeing, that's what I'm seeing happening as well too. Yeah, and that's, look, it's only a problem if you've stretched your borrowing capacity over the last sort of couple of years. So there's a couple of things that I'm I'm not really looking forward to, to seeing because I think that a lot of people might be, uh, you know, severely disadvantaged. There's a number of people, and the first one is a, a number of people that, um, they call them liar loans. So people that actually lied about their expenses to get the loan, um, to stretch themselves at, at a time where the market was at its peak. Um, so like they're gonna struggle and unfortunately they might, um, in some cases, lose their home, have to sell at a lower price, make a loss for whatever reason. The, the other one is is those people that at the time they could afford it, they really stretched themselves, like they, they told the truth, but they really stretched themselves to, to maximize their borrowing capacity, but they're, they're on a fixed interest rate of like high ones, low twos, and they're coming off that fixed interest rate in, in the next sort of year or so, let's say. Mm. So they're coming off a very ultra low interest rate that we've never seen before into, into potentially something that they've never been in. So yeah. we haven't had an interest rate rise in, in the last year, and they might be coming off a, a high one, low two interest rate to potentially high fours, low fives interest rate. It's really going to be a shock for those sort of people. So they're the sort mm. of two cohorts that I'm worried about in, in the mm. coming year or so. Yeah, so, uh, so for those listeners and viewers, prepare. Yeah, you can't predict, but you can prepare and prepare your cash flow to like you're on those rates when the time comes. Now, um, Gianni, it's been really, really great talking about property and probably we need to make a part two to this one because I, I love talking about property and kind of talk forever. Do you do this all day knowing us? But I, I just want to kind of maybe leave one or two tips for the, for the viewers and listeners and the ones we'll, we'll focus on many different cohorts but let's talk about the people that are maybe considering to invest in property what are maybe one or two tips that you can leave them look the first thing that i that i always tell people is before you invest in property a lot of people look at investing in property as a status symbol i, mm -hmm. I want to invest in property. i own investment property so they can make that claim but mm -hmm. the first thing that i always tell people is well, what makes you think property is the right vehicle for you because ultimately i, I want property to be a vehicle for people to achieve their goals. So I sort of talk about, well, what is your goal and how does, how does investing in property achieve that for you? So they sort of say, uh, look, I want to develop a passive income for the long term, or I'm looking to supplement my income in retirement or something along those lines that sort of indicates to me that, yes, you, you, you're looking to invest in property to meet your goals, then that makes sense rather than a status simple. So that's, that's probably the first one is ensure property is the right investment vehicle for you. Um, and then the second sort of tip is make data-driven decisions. So we talked a lot about um, supply and demand indicators. We talked about a lot about uh, assessing the cash flow for investment property. 
So uh, again, make those data driven decisions. So rather than um, you know making uh, sort of emotional decisions, um, people often make sort of emotional decisions around purchasing property. So I've seen a lot of people say, "Oh, this is a great area to to purchase a property because I grew up here." Or this is a great area to purchase property because I used to holiday here. I know this area well and blah, 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 blah. But they don't sort of make data-driven decisions. They don't um, look at the indicators for supply and demand and they don't assess the cash flow of that particular property. So they could be potentially worse off in, in the long run if they don't sort of make those decisions. Yeah, they're awesome tips. They're awesome tips. Um, Gianni, thank you very much for jumping on. And I think we're going to have to have a part two of this one. But uh, for all the viewers and listeners, if you like what you're hearing, like, reshare, uh, let people know about the podcast and, and what it's all about. And we'll have to deep dive into another session about property. Cheers. That was awesome. Thank you, mate. Appreciate it. Cheers.